All right then. Well, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the final day of our uh, week-long web3d.org webinar series. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, of course, we will have all of these uh, videos and materials on the Web3D Consortium YouTube channel. Uh, so I hope that you'll get to sort of look back and see on Monday, you know, we had a, a member meeting where we had a great review of all the different activities in the Web30 Consortium, the new features of X3D4, standardization, outreach, so you've got to meet the community. And so I hope you will um, join us for that. And then Tuesday we did a webinar called Learn X3D where Dr. Marchetti uh, and myself walked through some of the fundamentals of um, taking a 3D model and publishing it to the web. And those included things like X3D files in HTML5 and also things like um, GLTF and how to convert OBJ files and publish them on the web. So. There's some very nice material from Tuesday's webinar. And then yesterday, Wednesday, we discussed the engine ecosystem and all of the different software, softwares that are out there that load or render X3D. And we examined uh, several of our open source toolkits, did a kind of a deep dive with the developers, seeing some of the new X3D features and uh, and really looking at the variety of engines uh, and ways of publishing uh, vermal and x3d content so those were the uh, the first three days now today we're talking about authoring and here again um, we're really looking at uh, an ecosystem and there's so many ways to use vermal and the x3d standard it can it can feel pretty overwhelming at first, um, but hopefully these webinars give you a, a way in, a door uh, that you can uh, that you can walk through and um, take the kinds of materials and knowledge from these webinars and, and really start to, to create and publish yourself. So today, um, you know, we took a survey of extensible 3D and we've seen it being used in all sorts of uh, applications and um, before I start I just want to do um, thank some of my colleagues for contributing uh, materials to this presentation this was originally um, some of this material was given at the IEEE uh, VR conference we've done tutorials on X3D and so my colleagues Uwe Vossner from HLRS you'll see some of his slides and then uh, the folks from Fraunhofer IGD, Johannes Baer and Timo Sturm. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, what we get excited about when we talk about X3D is the fact that it's platform independent, right? We can take this same X3D files, the RML file, it's a scene graph, and we can, because it lives above the rendering library, we can run it on all kinds of devices. We're not tied to uh, an OpenGL installation or a DirectX renderer. Uh, in fact, um, as we saw with the applications on yesterday, on Wednesday, um, there are lots of engines on different platforms. Some of them are specialized for different things like haptic rendering or multi-screen stereo, but they all load X3D and with, you don't have to recompile an application every time you want to deliver to a new client. This is a great advantage. And of course, it's very important for us in academia and government that our data is durable and portable and we can get it to all kinds of clients um, over the next several decades. So this picture here is from the, the web3d.org website um, and it's really illustrating that um, exciting aspect of X3D, which is the same file that we've authored, right? I can load in my phone at the bottom left, a laptop, a multi-touch table uh, in here in the middle, and then in a 28 million pixel cave projection system. Same file, didn't recompile it. 
So how do we make X3D and kind of what, what is it? I'm gonna give a few minutes here at the beginning in case folks are new to this um, and just kind of give the high, high level points. This slide shows uh, the timeline of the standards coming from the Web3D Consortium and some of the tools that have been, and features that have been uh, evolved over the time. Uh, the first scene graph virtual reality modeling language, yeah, it goes back to 1994. And um, that standard didn't have um, dynamics interaction and animation. It was pretty much a static world. And then when they came with um, Vermal 2 in 97 slash 98, we added this interactivity and animations and start to bring those virtual worlds alive, okay? Um, over the years, we've evolved that VRML standard into what's called X3D. And I'll talk about some of the main differences and similarities for these content types. But you can kind of think of them as a little bit, basically X3D is the successor to VRML. So we took a lot of the VRML goodness brought it forward to an XML and a binary encoding and added some modern features like shaders and volume rendering. So X3D is really the evolved form, uh, XML compatible of the Vermal scene graph. I should mention that also here is that uh, if you go to the web3d.org website, you can find a draft specification of X3D4 uh, published for com public comment. You know, the Web3D Consortium is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to developing the standard and the tools to use the standard. So it's a great global community. And uh, one of the things about this community that I like so much, of course, is that they're very open and sharing. And even though our members have had first access in the development of this new standard, we're releasing it to the public to get further comment. And Web3D members will, will ratify some version of this document at the end of this calendar year and send it to ISO in December for uh, international ratification as a ISO standard. So X3D4, you'll see this a lot. Um, there's some, some exciting new features and goodness coming out um, in that spec. Uh, but pretty much everything that we're going to see today um, is based on X33 and moving forward. So we'll see a little bit of new, new 4.0 things, but a lot of these tools are, again, working on this platform that's over 20 years uh, mature. So um, some ways to think about publishing X3D content. As we saw yesterday, again, in the engines uh, session, there are um, nearly a dozen uh, open source or free standalone engines that will render your X3D content. Some of them you can make movies, uh, some of them you can hook up a haptic device to, etc. But when you're working with that kind of a system, of course, the user has to install a program. And once they do that, they have access to the whole horsepower of the machine, the GPU and the RAM. So that's a very um, performant way to go. But a lot of times people don't want to install large applications uh, if you're in a certain enterprise where you're not allowed to install things uh, without IT approval. This can be a real blocker. So there's a second mode of publication, which is really native HTML5 and JavaScript browsers. So there's no install required. And you can just show up with any browser and, uh, and be able to render this content. Now, these are working inside the web browser's memory sandbox. They're using WebGL, not full-blown OpenGL. So there's a little bit of a difference in what you can do, but that difference has gotten smaller and smaller um, over the last couple of years. These are really performant and uh, compliant uh, tools. So here's kind of the, uh, the quick you know, overview of those two different publishing modes. You know, along the left are the kind of installed standalone engines that you might want to use uh, or ask your clients to use as your deployment. And on the right are your um, JavaScript HTML5 implementations. So there's lots of choices. 
Um, and the same goes for authoring. Um, this slide, and we'll come back to it a couple of times, um, shows a range of different tools that can produce X3D slash VRML content. And I'll make sure that we hit the point of what's the difference and uh, why. But you can see here along the left, there's a great mix. Um, you've got your open source tools like Blender and MeshLab, which are supporting X3D. Um, there are pathways for 3D Studio Max. Got a little more detail on that. Um, the HLRS Studio Max exporter is uh, maintained and quite quite strong. Maya, Rhino. Um, one I use a lot is Paraview. It's a scientific visualization software. Also, Agisoft. It's photogrammetry. So if you're taking pictures or doing point cloud processing, you might be using Agisoft, and that supports the export. Uh, SketchUp, similarly. Creo, uh, Point Fuse, MATLAB. My students are using that a lot. You might make a 3D graph and want to publish it in the web page. Uh, MATLAB supports that X3D export. So there are a lot of sort of digital content creation tools and scientific software that lets you just basically save or export an X3D file. The ones in the middle um, are a little bit different um, in the sense that I would say they're uh, not exactly built for uh, some animation expert or a CAD expert or a civil engineer. They're, um, they're a little more specialized towards writing interactive scenes. And so these might have better support, for example, for uh, routing and uh, writing scripts and prototypes and some of the special features that, frankly, you don't need if you're just making a, a rendering a movie or a, an architectural walkthrough. Um, so uh, being able to develop your interactive environments with some of these other tools uh, Titania, which is a, a Linux-only uh, tool. X3D Edit, which is a structured XML uh, editor. It includes a preview, live preview, so you can do real visual editing of your scene live. Uh, Vividi Studio, which is an older but still quite uh, compliant uh, Windows authoring platform. And of course, you can make X3D using just style sheets, transforming any XML to some other XML. And uh, of course, we did that once upon a time with chemical markup language in the early aughts. Uh, let's look along the right hand side here. So um, there's a great online web service um, called uh, the NIH 3D Print Exchange, uh, 3dprint.nih.gov. And of course, there you can download. Uh, X3D versions of those models uh, on the website, everything from proteins to personal protective equipment and labware. Uh, what's nice is if you can get an X3D file from the print exchange, you can print that with uh, Cura or NetFab or Shapeways. So the X3D file can also be not just rendered on the screen, but rendered in uh, atoms. Another place that you might see X3D being produced is the uh, Industrial Strength Database, uh, PostGIS. Uh, it's a spatial database really made for um, spatial type of queries. And so you can get the result of any spatial query as an X3D fragment or scene. And so that's built into the database and the PostGIS. I'm going to take a quick look. I'm seeing some chat coming up. So let's take a moment here to look. What's going on? OK, great. So we're getting some, um, some links in the chat about uh, some of the topics I'm covering. So thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Anita Havele, our executive director of the Web3D Consortium. And she's running the show behind the curtain. Um, so thank you, Anita. Um, and then there's another kind of mode of producing X3D, which is basically just taking some other file and converting it, right? So there are general purpose uh, conversion tools like Okino Polytrans or Safe Software's FME, where you might want to take a, <clears throat> an FBX or a step or a shape file uh, and 
do some translation <clears throat> and output <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and output some other format. So you can automate these pipelines with Okino and safe software. So you can batch, you know, hundreds and thousands of models at a time on these conversion paths. Um, those are definitely industrial strength uh, and, and um, commercial software. Uh, AOPT is a command line converter and similarly view uh, 3D scene, which we'll, um, we'll see some more about AOPT uh, later, Avalon Optimizer. Okay, so these are going to be really useful for going in between different um, formats and especially for doing that in an automated way, right? Because, yeah, Blender and MeshLab will both take in an STL and save an X3D, but you might have to... Um, first way to do it is you have to go through the GUI. Um, you can script those as well, but that might be a topic for another, another webinar. Okay, so there's no shortage here of possibilities. Um, and I guess here's another short set, but in the scientific community, you know, it's of primary importance that the data lasts and is reproducible. Uh, otherwise, you know, science stops. So it's no wonder that uh, physicists, biochemists, and things uh, chose the ISO standard um, in their original tools and still supporting them today. Um, but if you're a chemical engineer or a chemist, you'll recognize these tools. They all support an X3D export. So here are a couple of resources. I mentioned that we're here uh, under the good graces of the Web3D Consortium, so web3d.org. Um, the specification link for 3.3 is there, so that's a great reference if you need to sort of remember what kind of um, field is on a directional light. Uh, you can look it up there quite easily. Um, there's a book, which you can see here, X3D for uh, web graphics for web authors. And that site has a whole supporting set of examples and slides that are used actually in the Naval Postgraduate School uh, master's class on virtual environments. So slide decks, examples, uh, the book. And um, you can also check, uh, for example, the Virginia Tech Library has a digital copy of this. You can read it uh, online. Too. What are we building when we want to make this X3D file? Well, we're building a scene graph. And we get to put all kinds of stuff in there, right? Because remember, we're trying to build a rich multimedia experience, and arrange and compose models and assets, lighting. We need all a way to describe all of these things and to make them work together. And that's essentially what VRML and X3D do. They create a scene graph. And the scene graph can, uh, is basically a hierarchical structure. You have a little, directed acyclic possibility with you look at the ways that we can reuse parts of the graph. But the, the image here on the right kind of gives you the, a picture of it, right? We might have two shapes. Um, they share the same geometry, but have different appearances. They're both in different places. So the transform node above them might put them in different places in the scene. And uh, in this case, we've got one of those shapes is a light switch. It's got a sensor on it. And when that sensor goes off, it's going to send a route to the point light and turn it on. Okay. That's really how a scene graph works. It kind of set up the uh, transformation graph, which is all of these solid lines on the right. And you can also set up the behavior graph, which is basically how events flow through the system, and declaring essentially the route of flow of events. And that's what that um, dashed line, red line is. Okay, so there's a lot that we can do with X3D. Let's think about, again, sort of where we're, what we're targeting here, what level of abstraction. We're not writing GL code, right? We're not compiling or managing every triangle and matrix stack. We're thinking about objects, shapes, and things that happen much more at the application level. So by working above the rendering layer at a scene graph, we can then move that scene graph and have it be rendered in all kinds of different places, right? So DirectX, WebGL, OpenGL, Pavre, I've seen X3D Pavre renderers. 
So it has a quite a rich scope uh, in terms of what kinds of things you can put into a scene. And what we do is we build up the scene with the various shapes and so on, and then in the runtime it gets traversed for rendering. Um, this is a little bit of a dense slide, but I think what I would like to call your attention to is really the, um, the first couple of bullets. So, as I mentioned, there's lots of features in X3D. You don't necessarily need to use them all. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, if you're doing something like uh, some set of objects, say in a product catalog, <clears throat> right? You're not, you don't necessarily need to have um, support for some advanced volume rendering. Right, so you can actually deliver a, a subset of the X3D spec, and the way we do this is with profiles and components. So just as a heads up, you don't necessarily need to use the whole spec. There are ways, and quite effective ways, of using uh, sort of profiles of functionality. When you look at an X3D file, um, you can tell a few things by the file extension, and we'll go into that a little bit later. But basically, that scene graph, the X3 scene graph, can be encoded equivalently in different languages, in different ways. So the UTF-8 is your classic kind of uh, formal text, uh, brace bracket sort of syntax. XML, you know about that syntax binary or JSON. It's the same scene graph. It's just encoded in a different way. And of course, we can get at that scene graph and manipulate it with some different APIs and uh, language bindings. Here's a quick uh, look at, you know, if you're, you've got a bunch of files sitting on your um, drive or you've downloaded from the web and you're trying to figure out what's in them, um, this, uh, this might come in handy. This is a diagram that is in the specification and has shown up in some other presentation before, but you see in the middle is that abstract scene graph. And on the left, in the blue, are different encodings of that scene graph. So I mentioned the XML, Vermal, the binary, the JSON, which is in the, in the pipeline. And on the right-hand side, in the green, are different ways to manipulate that scene graph at runtime with the programming language. So JavaScript, ECMAScript, and Java, and we're seeing uh, DOM work happening a lot with those HTML5 browsers. So the power of um, X3D really comes into being able to pull content from all of these different sources, compose them, and, um, and then deliver them in some real-time interactive way either to that standalone browser or to into the web page. So a couple of things as you're going through and authoring X3D, just to sort of remember, unless there is a unit statement in that file at the header, you're assuming it to be meters. And so this can really be important. Say, for example, you get a, a, a car model from one website, and you download it, and then you bring in a human model from another website. Well, the car is in meters and the human is in inches, right? So immediately things aren't at the right scale. But with one line of X3D scale XYZ, you can do that conversion and now you'll be in the common uh, spatial frame, which again we would assume to be meters. Um, when we're rotating stuff, we think of our rotations in radians, not in degrees. So when you see an orientation number or a rotation number, uh, that fourth value is, uh, is radians. And we're in a right-hand coordinate system. Okay. Right-hand coordinate system basically means that I'm, here's my right hand, uh, my thumb is pointing on the positive axis. Okay. And if I do a positive rotation around that axis, I'm going to wrap my hands around it. That's, that's the positive direction. Okay. So when we do a right-hand coordinate system, and I put in a negative rotation, it's actually going to go the other way. Okay, so right hand, the coordinate system. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the key features and the fundamentals of virtual reality modeling language are in X3D. 
So there's a really nice way if you want to, for example, go from a vermal file to an X3D file. Um, you would basically change the file extension from a WRL to a .x3dv. And then you'd go into the first uh, line of the file to the header and change it from vermal 2 to vermal 3 because it's the UTF-8 encoding, classic vermal encoding, same node set, very easy to migrate forward. And that will be an X3DV file. So I mentioned before, when we went from VRML to X3D, there was a lot of new features. And of course, there's a lot of ways to author uh, these features, which is why I'm bringing it up in this webinar. Um, we introduced new encodings. I mentioned XML and binary. We introduced shaders. So um, we're seeing a lot of great work in the community with GLSL shaders and X3D. Uh, rigid body physics, volume rendering, and distributed interactive simulation, which is basically a way to tie together uh, remote clients in a multi-user, consistent multi-user world. It's something that um, the military uses quite a lot. Um, going from 3.x to 4, uh, we're doing this HTML encoding that's in the spec, that publicly released draft. Um, new language bindings, DOM API, and what's exciting too is that now in 4.0, you can use GLTF assets in your scenes as well. Okay, now folks might not have heard about GLTF. I'll mention it. Uh, quickly here, and there's some more resources later. Um, the Kronos group who produces the spec describes GLTF as the JPEG for 3D. And I kind of like that because uh, this analogy can hold in the same way that GLTF uh, is to X3D. Okay, so if you're in an HTML file and you want to use it for JPEG, right, you're saying how big is it, where is it, uh, where's the URL that I'm getting it from? And that image is packed up, you know, maybe it's a JPEG, so it's got some compression. It moves quickly over the web, goes right into the graphics card. That's great, asset. But when we compose our assets to make a real application, a real web, web page, all of a sudden that JPEG is just a piece. And I think that's how you should think about GLTF in X3D applications. Because you can, again, bring in GLTF models, put them in places, wire them up to events, and uh, use the larger framework of X3D to do all the application stuff, you know, the interactivity, the lot behavior and logic of the scene. Um, the same way that HTML marks up 2D documents, X3D essentially marks up 3D documents. Okay, so that's an exciting thing about authoring is we're going to see this a lot more in the future, GLTF assets in X3D scenes. Um, I want to draw your attention to the examples that the Web3D Consortium publishes. There are um, thousands in this archive. And some of the things I wanted to draw your attention to, you can see here in the screenshot, um, every model in this archive starts as one file, one .x3d file. So the XML encoding. And every night, right, uh, I forget if it's Jenkins or, or some, some nice Apache daemon, rolls through this directory of X3d files and builds the website every night from scratch. So it's consistent. And every time it takes that one X3d file and it transcodes it. So you can see uh, a JSON encoding, the classic vermal encoding of that same model, the binary encoding. So this can be really instructive, um, as well as uh, your JavaScript uh, in-browser publication buttons, Excite and Xfreedom. So an exciting thing is just to remember that the model, the content is the content and it can be encoded in lots of different ways. And that's what this table is on the right here. Um, thankfully, a lot of this is built into your typical Apache and Nginx distribution. So if you're running a web server, it's already likely that you already have these. But as you know, um, 
in web delivery and HTTP requests, the client always gets a content type first so that they know what to do with it, right? So it's a binary blob, it's a HTML text, it's a, a JPEG. Um, everything that's delivered off a web server comes with a content type first. And that content type is basically determined in a lookup table. You'll see here on the right, this is uh, in the Apache configuration for MIME types, so that when I get an X3D file from my server, it's of type model x3d.xml, and my client knows what to do with that. Okay, so that's just sort of a basic of web technology. Um, I encourage you to visit the, the Web3D examples archive, and you can see sort of how that, that works from the user side. There are um, more resources there to dig into, um, and I'll let you uh, take that on your own time, um, but the YouTube channel and the Twitter channel are great resources again to see what's possible with getting data and applications to x3d all right we've seen this one i'm going to skip it all right so let's get into some stuff about x3d content um, we mentioned this one mode where we just have an exporter um, and we save as or export an x3d file from the application so matlab bmd pair of you, uh, these work that way. Um, but they're not necessarily built as digital content creation tools, right? There's some data domain specific uh, application. Then you've got authoring tools that are made for digital content creation, the Blender, the Modo, Studio Max. Um, I forgot to present Modo. Uh, it also supports X2D uh, export. There's the converter path I mentioned, Polytrans. Cat Exchanger, or FME, Safe Software. Another really common mode, and it um, uh, it's something that we use actually a lot at Virginia Tech in my group, is we use scripts to produce X3D documents. So uh, oftentimes in my work, we're getting uh, from different data scientists some big spreadsheet or a giant LiDAR point cloud or something. And I will just write a 20, 30 line Python script to take those values and populate them into a color node or a coordinate or something. So I'm really just doing a text, creating a text file, X3D file, from the raw data. And I'm applying some logic in that script. So that's very common. And sometimes you may want to do that with the output from some of these tools. Uh, run a post-processing script on the output to clean it up because um, there's always uh, you always find edge cases in some of these exporters where the person didn't really know the spec and so instead of and this is a good example in the old versions of um, VMD they would and this makes sense if you're a chemist you're interested in every triangle and surface so they would export X3D where every triangle was its own shape. Well, that might make sense to the chemist, but when you're doing interactive 3D graphics, that's going to be terrible for your graphics card, right? The way you want to do it is put all of those triangles in a shape, and you can give it to the graphics card at once. So you can find, that is fixed, by the way. Um, so thank you, um, John. But uh, there, there can be situations like that, where you might want to run a cleanup script on the output and produce a, a, another X3D file. Tools like Aopter are, are very nice for that actually as well. And then the trusty text editor. So um, I'll try to uh, avoid my um, uh, soapbox too much on that, but I have to say that um, you know really the best way still um, for people to author X3D content, and I tell this to my students, is with a text editor. Um, I'd like to um, highlight a couple that are out there. I mentioned X3D Edit, which is the Java base with the Visual Preview um, XML editor. So you can't build an invalid scene in X3D Edit. It's always going to be valid. It's pretty cool. Um, Atom is a nice text editor. It has a built-in HTTP server. So if you're testing things with a, a website, uh, that can be very efficient to just quick make a change, look at is it live. Um, working Notepad++ and BB Edit have syntax highlighting, so that's really nice as you're 
going through and trying to find stuff quickly. Um, and then we have a, a whole set of these digital content creation tools, which we'll uh, get into more. So I mentioned the exciting prospect of integrating GLTF and X3D. And I think um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to underscore this idea and to uh, let you know there's a blog um, where I've written these ideas up. And the long and short of it, it builds on that analogy, right? If you want to make a, uh, an interactive application that works with web services and the DOM at this higher level, um, that kind of functionality isn't in a, described in the GLTF file. It's not in the JPEG, right? It's in the higher level language, the HTML or the X3D. So this is really exciting. Um, and we've seen members uh, posting support and examples in all the latest browsers. And the reason I guess that's, um, also uh, exciting is because GLTF, it doesn't have lots of stuff like I mentioned, lights, interactivity, and so on. What it does have is physically based rendering. So the physically based rendering really lets you specify materials in a new way. And uh, it's quite compelling visually. And so um, having the support for physically based rendering in X3D is another great milestone for four. And actually, for the four browsers that we saw yesterday uh, all support that. Um, a couple of other key things about authoring. Um, there is a, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> the X3D file can carry metadata with it. And that's important because once you put something out on the web, right, there's no getting it back. <laughs> um, and of course, if uh, you've got some piece of content floating out there without attribution or licensing information or provenance data uh, or contextual information, um, it's just a piece of content. It's not meaningful, right? And so having metadata in the scene um, can be very powerful. And we've demonstrated that with uh, CAD vocabularies, uh, museum and natural heritage vocabularies. Uh, and medical vocabularies. Right? They, that, that information lives in the scene and it's the same language that the DICOM speaks, uh, the DICOM PAC system speaks, right? Um, another thing that's down here that's worth mentioning is uh, the use, uh, because we're compatible with XML and all of that uh, goodness that the W3C uh, has worked on over these years. It means we can use their authentication and encryption mechanism. Okay, so and what's neat is it's not really on a file by file level. Um, so the way to think about this one is, um, let's say I, I, I've, I've got that product catalog uh, example. Um, there may be a level of detail that's um, that's good for a preview and good for marketing uh, sort of purposes, but it's not the thing you would actually machine with, right? That's the high resolution version. Well, you might have them in a level of detail and the only one, only time you can get to the high level resolution uh, model is by authenticating and decrypting it using the W3C standards. So again, anything in the web that does W3C um, will be able to play with this and essentially you can control the distribution of your X3D content at a fragment level, not at a document level. So that's kind of neat. All right, so I mentioned this behavior graph. You're gonna see this in a lot of the, as soon as you open an X3D file, you'll probably see route tags around. And that's really how we drive the animations and the interactions. Um, oftentimes we're adding our application logic with some kind of JavaScript um, that processes those events uh, and does things according to our, our requirements. Um, a great way to see, uh, again, without making any, any installs uh, on your machine, to see X3D in action and the variety of features that you can author in the language 
is to go to the two um, example pages for the JavaScript um, tutorials for XFreedom and for Excite. Um, they both uh, provide some really nice uh, demos. And again, Control U is your friend. If you're looking at a web page and you want to say, how do they do that? Control U gives you the source of that page. And, um, and that's kind of a, a great reason to be able to go to a, see an example and say, oh, I want to change that JPEG with my picture, right? That, that would be one line in that, in that uh, file. Okay, so I think what I want to spend the most of the time here, well, my remaining time, is really showing you some workflows. Um, because again, there's uh, so many ways to get from here to there. And uh, it's it can be easy to get lost, so that's why we we need to you know um, lean on on experts and teachers and guides and the community to sort of help. And I encourage you all to, um, of course, join the Web three D consortium, but also uh, to um, subscribe to the X three D public uh, listserv, uh, where lots of discussions, questions, and knowledge uh, go down. Okay, excuse me. Um, so yeah, I have to say my favorite X3D tool is still a text editor. Um, but uh, one thing you can uh, you can watch out for is uh, you may open a file in a text editor and it looks like gobbledygook. Well, it probably means that at some point it was a vermal file and it got zipped. So don't worry about the file extension. Unzip it and you'll be able to see the scene graph there. Okay, so that, that's just a common thing you might encounter. Um, I mentioned that uh, Adam has a simple server extension so you can quickly test uh, things you're changing. All right, so here's just one. Um, you know, we have a design printing and scanning working group in the Web3D Consortium. And uh, this includes um, some of our members like Dr. Marchetti, um, EDF France, right? So the nuclear power company of France. They've got lots of CAD models and lots of scans, and they need to be able to use them and read them for the next 30 years. So uh, standards are important uh, to, to many of these long-term infrastructures. And here's a, sort of a path kind of notionally of how you might go from that CAD design tool Creo form or something like that, you would export through um, a series of formats and then publish it either to a standalone X3D browser or to an HTML um, web page, or you could take that X3D file and 3D print it. Okay, so we're often thinking about things in terms of workflows and pipelines because, I mean, let's let's be honest, you know. The CAD designer, the engineer, they've already got the tools they need uh, to do their domain specialty. Where X3D really excels is to be able to sort of put all of these assets in a common lingua franca. <laughs> um, and so by doing this kind of mashup, um, really unlock new kinds of value, stuff that you couldn't do back upstream. For example, uh, you know, ArcGIS. Um, wouldn't have uh, a great support for um, immersive caves. Right? That's not what it's, that tool is for. Right? So we want to get it into the greatest common denominator format, and that's X3D. Um, here's another example. Um, this is one that we use also at Virginia Tech, um, essentially using some for some scientists or civil engineer or someone who's doing simulation on the supercomputer or for their uh, for their research, using some post-processing tool, like in this case, I might have written a script or maybe I'm using Paraview and I just export an X3D scene from Paraview. I can then bring that into other digital content creation tools like my Blender or my Mesh Lab do some tweaking, maybe optimizing, arranging, and then again, uh, put the X3D file, same X3D file, can go to the installed browser, 
can go to the HTML5 page, you can go to the 3D printer. Okay, I'm going to do a couple here. So those were from, uh, thanks for, to EDF um, for sharing those. Here's a couple from HLRS. This is, um, the, I think they've currently got the largest uh, supercomputer in um, Germany, uh, which is relatively recent. We were there in 18 for IEEE VR, and they were very gracious hosting us in their cave. Um, but yes, uh, Covis and Open Cover are tools that are built on this exact premise, which is scientists, experts, they have their tools. What's really needed is this presentation layer and a way to mash up, format, interact with this data when it comes together outside of the proprietary tools. So there's a series of demos here. These are all real applications um, that HLRS and Uwe Vossner's uh, group have accomplished. And you'll see on the left kind of the, the basic flow, the workflow of the tools that they used to get to this place. And again, they're showing these in uh, X3D, so you can run that in the desktop or in the cave or on your phone or tablet. So here they're going from a CAD program. Uh, they're getting it into 3D Studio Max. I'm not sure what the file format is there. Um, and then from Studio Max, they're exporting X3D, and that X3D they load into their um, their own runtime. Covis Open Cover is an installed uh, X3D engine. Uh, here, there you can use Covis and Open Cover again for multi-screen stereo and tracking uh, displays. And here's the um, uh, the hemisphere over at Cal IT2 running Covis. And uh, so this is 74K uh, televisions tiled together. And you can see it's running um, an X3D VRML file coming right out of the protein data bank. So this is stuff that uh, biochemists and en chemical engineers use all the time, the protein data bank. And uh, like I mentioned before, a lot of those scientific tools support a way to get out. Um, and well, in this case, he's using PyMol to VRML. Uh, simulations, starting with a 3D LiDAR scan of this um, furnace uh, building. They then um, create meshes for the, the objects. They put that into a simulation engine. So for example, to look at the combustion efficiency of this uh, furnace. Uh, they pull that scientific data out with OpenDX. And they put in you know, the laser scan model now with the simulation results together, mashed up. You guessed it, in X3D. Uh, here's another example. This one is also a, sort of an issue very close to, uh, to my heart and my friends, um, Stuttgart 21. Um, rather a, a controversial project, um, I could say. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a huge, massive civil construction building project for the new train station at Stuttgart. It's, it's a huge project. Uh, but here you can see, uh, going from the all plan tool that the civil engineers use, going through Max to X3D, and then visualizing it immersively. More, more mashups, more data. Um, I just love what these guys are doing. So you have a whole bunch of different system design elements going into, this is like building information management, going into some tool like Revit, well, that's great. Once you get it to Revit, you can take it to Studio Max and then, yeah, X3D and then to the web or to the cave for a group design review. Uh, they also did a, a great one of this uh, new um, elevator that Tyson Krupp is uh, designing. Uh, and there again, going to the greatest common denominator for the presentation layer means that uh, we're basically using each tool for what it's good for, right? Those upstream engineering tools, we're not going to do without them, but they're never going to do, you know, VR or web publishing. So we really do need this ecosystem. Okay, I'm um, winding up my time. I'm going to continue, though, uh, and I'll check the Q&A um, in just a moment. 
and if there's any questions or something in the chat, I'll, I'll try to address it in the remaining time. But as I mentioned, you know, sometimes these exporters are not uh, super clean and you might need to massage uh, them a little bit. Okay. So I'm not going to go into any of these too closely, but uh, I want to make sure I get to the Studio Max one. Mesh Lab, amazing tool, uh, originally um, built for uh, you know large-scale laser scan cultural heritage applications. They realized when they scanned David with a laser and it was three trillion points, you know they needed a tool to do good geometry processing. And Mesh Lab is the open source uh, tool. It's really a go-to. Tool for model processing. Titania is a Linux based full featured visual editor. Uh, you can see some of the features here in the screenshots. Um, but being able to build your scene to hierarchy, the transformation graph, you can see it all right there. To wire up your um, behavior graph with a nice visual editor and doing things right in there with scripts and live runtime compilation and so on so a very nice tool and uh it's distributed on uh, on linux blender uh blender is also a go-to uh, for lots of reasons excuse me um just make sure you get the uh, latest version uh 2.7 we use that for many years um, and uh, then when they changed the plugin architecture, a bunch of stuff broke. But now we're back to um, our support of the X3D import export. Um, so that's really great news. And of course, Blender has its own uh, renderer, cycles renderer. So you could do high-end animation um, once you import your X3D models. This is the one I, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss. Because you saw it several times uh, show up in um, the HLRS uh, applications. But um, University of Stuttgart and HLRS support uh, their own third party exporter for Studio Max. And they keep it really relatively up to date. Um, you, they really do it, especially for their um, architecture and civil engineering programs. Um, but uh, it's published you can get it you can add it to your studio max and it even supports some kinds of things some interactivity uh, so it's sort of even pulling studio max closer to a game engine in a certain way uh, but that's a great resource and, and thanks to um to our friends in Stuttgart. so here's a picture of the third party exporter from studio max um yeah you can do animations you can deal with deaf use instances and of course it supports um Vermal and X3D. Uh, you can get the source for it if you want to. Um, they did release it. Uh, and so you can inc build your own or even improve it. Uh, and we would welcome uh, folks who are interested in doing that. And then the binaries. OK, a couple notes about Maya. Um, Maya does. Uh, have a vermal exporter that ships with it. Uh, there's also a third party plugin called Rocky, which um, uh, you can add. It has basically pretty much all of the main X3D 3.3 features. Uh, I mentioned Okino Polytrans, uh, scriptable batch type converter. So you can automate and convert thousands of models. This one has a couple of packs. So if you're doing CAD, you might buy one sort of pack. Um, and uh, if you're doing you know, more like digital content creation um, and you want like the best FX and other things, you might uh, get that pack. Safe software, um, again, supports X3D and its automated chains. Now, the last part of the slides I'm going to skip, uh, these are really kind of more of as reference um, to talk about if you're in one of these tools or you're in the time editor and you see things like this like something called a point light you know what is that so i'm um, basically just running through some different kinds of cameras um, your transformation and grouping um, shapes different kinds of environment nodes 
um, how to do shaders and volumes, and, uh, and, and some things about animation, the, the basic pattern of how you wire up an animation, um, making them interactive with sensors, uh, adding um, application logic with scripts, um, being able to use things like uh, physics, these are fun um, demos. And then uh, finally, a little bit about the volume rendering, which is a 3.x, uh, it's not in Vermal, but um, you can see we can take a stack of volume images, uh, run some Python scripts on them to publish, uh, to publish the volume in the web browser. And so there's several uh, examples and pieces of code for that. All right, so I'm going to um, check the Q&A and the um, chat for just a moment. And we'll see if there's anything to catch up on before I left. Um, let's see, it looks like we've got a whole bunch of great, useful uh, links in here. Thank you so much. Um, anything in the q and I don't see anything. OK. Well, I hope this was useful. Um, I know it's a lot to take in uh, in an hour, uh, but hopefully with the sort of the cumulative knowledge that you're getting from this week of webinars, it makes some sense. And um, maybe you're know enough now to be dangerous uh, making X3D. I'd like to introduce the next uh, speaker. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, as a matter of fact. I first met uh, Mufti in uh, Stuttgart in 2000 when I was a judge for a, a new media film festival. And I gave a talk um, on how to uh, use VRML as a cinematographer uh, for filmmakers, basically. And we had a great, uh, a great time. And over the years, uh, I met again at HLRS um, when I visited Uwe. Um, Mufti has been a open source advocate uh, for several decades. He's been producing uh, some great software, uh, again, based on these standards. And whereas um, I think the last hour, you know, we kind of spent um, more at the uh, IT, you know, communications technology kind of level, he's been really interested in getting tools into people's hands uh, and getting them to create stuff, even if they're new to 3D graphics. So students um, and, uh, and newbies, if you will. So he's been um, producing a, a great tool called White Doom. And I'd like to uh, welcome Mufti, if you're here. Uh, let's see. That looks like he is not on the uh, channel at the moment. So we'll wait a few minutes.